In the early hours of July the 28th, 1794, the leaders of the French Republic's Committee of Public Safety had gathered for one last time. What's wrong? Their once colossal power evaporating with every minute. But under whose name? Maxime. For 12 months, Maxime. Maximilien Robespierre had ruled revolutionary France in the name of the people. The convention has ceased to represent the people. We must sign in the but name... But now, in the name of the people, soldiers were on their way to seize him. His dictatorship was over. Do you think we should sign in the name of the people? And he was about to become the final victim of his own bloody reign of terror. What happened next to Robespierre is still not fully known. Two shots were fired. And one hit him flush in the mouth. A badly wounded Robespierre was ultimately finished off by the guillotine. But arguments about the man still rage. Had his revolution created the modern world or betrayed it? It was really a system of loathsome paranoia which was responsible for the butchering of tens of thousands of perfectly innocent lives. But wait a minute. In a liberal way, you know, liberals don't like people who are ready to sacrifice themselves. For them, if you are too radical, you are already one step towards uh, totalitarianism. At stake is the status of Robespierre as a founding father of state terror. The first in a line of modest men with access to a higher truth. Men who loved humanity so much they felt entitled to exterminate the human beings who stood in its way. One year to the day before his grisly death, Maximilian Robespierre was appointed to the Committee of Public Safety. The innocuous four words disguising the most awesome institution in revolutionary France. A provincial lawyer from Arras, he'd been destined for a life of obscurity until 1789, when he was propelled into the storm centre of the greatest event in history since the fall of the Roman Empire, the French Revolution. The revolutionaries had challenged the might and arrogance of the French court in Versailles. They'd executed their king and created a republic, whose watchwords were liberty, equality and the rights of man. A government whose sovereignty was based in the people. But the revolutionaries also dreamed of a new type of society, one where human nature might be born again where men and women, freed from tyranny and social custom, could achieve moral perfection. No one believed in this republic of virtue more than Robespierre himself. But in Robespierre, the Jacobin, the world got its first glimpse of a new type. A man who believed that the road to virtue lay not through persuasion, but through terror. Virtue without terror is impotent. Terror without virtue is blind, no? I accept this totally. I don't have any problem. I don't have any problem. I mean, I mean uh, the crucial point of every radical movement is to have terror through virtue. In order to establish the fundamentals of democracy, you have to go through this zero level of Jacobinism. You cannot say we could have done it in a much easier way. Have we learned nothing from the Gulag? Have we learned nothing from the Third Reich? It's, it's unconscionable and horrifying in the name of intellectual fashion and a kind of patrician remoteness. You know, the sense in which, above all, it doesn't really matter if thousands and thousands of people are slaughtered, as long as somehow bourgeois notions of liberal individual rights are overthrown. The use of violence to perfect humanity was the brainchild of the Committee of Public Safety. In 1793, the unruly energies released by the revolution had been bottled up in this room. And it was here, in 12 murderous months, 
that the modern idea of state terror was born. It's a moment in time when a society really does try and change itself without a model to fall back on, without a real sense of the edges of possibility. And seeing how that can go very badly wrong is, of course, an object lesson. The men on the Committee of Public Safety who worked the levers of this powerful machine included Lazar Carnot, mathematician, engineer and natural-born bureaucrat. His rival was the puritanical Saint-Just, whose astonishing maiden speech in the assembly had called for the execution of the king. But take the liquor out of the convention hall and you'll get more rational debates. Perhaps. But I've also known crashing bores who swear allegiance to only lemonade. A third member was the crippled lawyer Georges Couton. Thank you, citizens. Thank you. On his very first day as deputy, Couton had proposed the abolition of royalty. And before the revolution, he'd won a literary prize for an essay on patience. Come on! Come on! Put your backs into it! Another lawyer, Hero de Seychelles, was in some ways the committee's most surprising member. Hero's godmother was Marie Antoinette. Do you have shortages of soap in Paris as we have in Nîmes? So I said to him, are you making a comment about the capital in general or just about me? It was this group of men that Robespierre joined on the 27th of July, 1793. Ah, Honoured citizens, salutations. Yes, welcome to the Queen's boudoir. So this is where she powdered her cheeks. All four of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're people who are absolutely consumed by the public work of, of pushing the revolution onwards. They really do come out of obscurity. These essentially obscure provincials um, find themselves running a country, running a war effort, and, and in a sense sort of grow into that role, but also very clearly are always wrestling with, with the, the immensity of the task they've set themselves. Revolutionary France had declared war on its neighbours, but by 1793, the Republic was fighting for its life. Five imperial armies were massed on her borders, with the Austrians in the north just three days' march from Paris. Each imperial army had promised to crush the regicides and annihilate the new Republic. A ruinous economic blockade had reduced much of the country to famine, and civil war was simmering in the Vendée and the south. There are those who say that the state terror that was about to unfold was not the result of an excess of idealism, but this incredible external duress. The committee member appointed to organize France's defense was Lazare Carnot. There are some figures like Lazare Carnot who are really bureaucrats, who make sure that enough bread, enough flour, enough you know, salt fish and so on gets to the soldiers who are in the field and they don't freeze their rear ends off in, in misery. I would begin with the state of affairs in... Um, unless, of course, you wish to... Uh... No, no. Please, why don't you... Um... I would prefer to listen. Very well. The Army of the North. Uh, this was captured two days ago from the Austrians just outside Antwerp. It doesn't tell us anything we didn't already suspect. England has permanent designs on Dunkirk and Toulon. The Duke of York would not reject the crown if it were offered. Austria and Prussia want to take bites out of Ardennes and Lorraine, and the Dutch will be allowed to nibble some of the north. No one will be left out. They all want a piece of beautiful France. Yes. Even the little king of Sardinia has dreams that he will one day place his fat ass in Provence. <laughs> <laughs> Their plan is to dismember this country. We are not Poland. This committee is not just a group of futile students in Warsaw. The French Republic exists. It is a product of philosophy, but it is also a product of real events. And behind the idea is the sovereign people. 
20 million Frenchmen aching to enter the age of Rousseau. Very good. You're not short of speeches in the army. We are, however, short of nearly everything else. The army of the north has two million pounds of gunpowder. It requires 30 million pounds of gunpowder. The army of the Moselle is constantly short of bread. Almost all the other armies are short of shot, cartridges, shoes, horses, and most importantly, copper. God made France beautiful, but he did not supply us with copper for our cannon. Uh, you will notice that we are in receipt of a small supply from uh, Hungary. From between the legs of the Habsburg Emperor. <laughs> we can always count on our enemies to stab each other in the back. <laughs> Most of our cannon are forged from copper that is scavenged from our own barns, from French churches, from bells, from the altars, from icons, from confessional boxes. Cannons out of confessional boxes. I call that progress. Mm. As for gunpowder, <laughs> this committee must act now to enforce a national search for saltpetre. Every French citizen must scrape every attic, every cellar, and it must be made an act of patriotic duty. This can be done. Good. But our real problem, a real supply problem, is with our generals. Damn them. I cannot use a single cavalry regiment with confidence because I know royalists hide there. I cannot entirely trust a single battalion of infantry because I know an officer may take those men across the line to fight on the other side. Have faith, citizen. Remember Valmy. We do not need another Valmy, Georges. Valmy was a patriotic sensation. And very nearly a military catastrophe. 100,000 volunteers walking towards the sound of gunfire. I would take another Valmy, citizen. What, men who should have been at the harvest? Men who would have been better employed repairing the roads so that artillery could get to the front. Men who were told to march to the sound of gunfire, men who had never heard the sound of gunfire, and when they did, they were useless. Not one single weapon the same, hundreds of different calibre, many men carrying scythes, pitchforks, to march against the King of Austria. No, chaos. We do not need another Valmy. These men only understood one command, to march against the aristocrats. That is a good command. Oh, it is an excellent command, morally, citizen. But it is no substitute for organisation. One forgets how good the late Ancien Regime was at mobilising resources. There are a lot of beady-eyed procurers of necessary stuff. Those sort of people had a lot to be getting on with. They are kind of rather like, you know, Churchill's war cabinet. They are busy, 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 busy. They know all about how to deliver gunshot and cannon and guns. And you can't really have a complete bloody loony sort of really calling the shots. My God, if you read some of the attacks from Robespierre, it would have seen as if you know, they exerted the full dictatorship, just played this game, how can we kill more people? Are people aware that practically, literally, the whole of Europe declared war on France? Foreign powers effectively were deeply involved into helping counter-revolution. At that time, to say Republic is in danger, it wasn't the Stalinist excuse to kill another million of people, and so on and so on. Robespierre in particular was always warning of the dangers of letting one man have too much military power. He looked back to classical antiquity and, and said, you know, look what happened with Julius Caesar, uh, who crossed the Rubicon and turned the army on Rome. And this is something that might happen in France. I was against this war, Citizen Connor. When every speech in the assembly was a drum and bugle speech, I said war was a mistake. That is ancient history. We will soon water our horses by the Thames. We shall turn London into a new Carthage. Spring shall be brought to Europe. Jacobin clubs will open in Berlin, in Vienna, in Warsaw. All were said in front of me to justify the war policy. 
Yes. <laughs> Armies of slaves facing our army of free men would instantly lay down their weapons and plead with French bombardiers to remove their chains. We would have universal peace and liberty at the point of a French bayonet. But we forgot to ensure our own liberty first. We entrusted a king to fight a war of liberty, and then we wondered at the betrayals. And now we must fight to defend ourselves. And in citizen Carno resides great organizational wisdom, I'm sure. Copper, saltpeter, fodder for horses. Good, good. These things should be organized on a national basis. I have spoken for such in the Jacobins. But... This war will be won here, not at the front. Our liberty will be won here. And for that, we must produce honest government and build virtuous institutions. The founding of a republic is not child's play, nor is it the work of brutes, which is the same thing. Wisdom as well as power presided at the creation of the universe. Finished, not quite, Citizen Carno. We complete this business. We do not parley with our enemies. As my friend Saint Just said in the convention, we take from and send our enemies nothing but lead. And always let us remember enemies are also in France. They may not announce themselves for our convenience. Many wear the red bonnet and cockade, but their mission is identical to that of the slave powers which surround us, to destroy the virtue of the French people. Now, Rousseau said the people want what is good, but they don't always see it. It is our job to see it for them and to act accordingly. ISIS citizens? ISIS. Why not, hmm? You have to ask yourself whether he was in the right place. Was he a practical politician? He thought that the language of virtue was the only possible revolutionary discourse. He did not think that the language of pragmatism was the appropriate one in which to discuss the revolution. You can say he was out of place there, that what he really was was a prophet. More terrifyingly, according to his enemies, Robespierre was a prophet armed with scripture. A scripture he was determined to enact in France regardless of the human cost. The scripture was the social contract by Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a work that was said to have hardly left Robespierre's side. In it, Rousseau had argued that an increase in liberty would result in an increase in virtue because it would bring man closer to his original, exalted nature. Most of the revolutionaries are men of the Enlightenment. They believe that human character is like a blank slate. People's character, people's identity is formed by the sense impressions which uh, bombard them from the earliest uh, period. In some ways, what's happening in the revolution is the extension of that principle from the individual to the society. So the sense is that one can start again. One can bring people into a new regime and make new men of them. Another admirer. I do nothing to encourage it. I think virtue translates badly into this rather prim English word, virtue. I think virtue meant strength, it meant honesty, it meant purity of intent. You see, saint Just was already saying that it is a crime to fail to hate the enemies of the revolution. So a very high standard of engagement 
was being required here. It's not a high standard. It's only a high standard if you want the world to dissolve into tyranny. Saint-Just is he's a deeply intolerant person, as indeed is Maximilien Robespierre. The notion of power as schoolmasterliness, equipped not just with the right to cane you, but cut your head off. He does believe in an elite class, the guardians, who are the kind of mystical um, receiving antennae of uh, sort of tremble in the ether coming down, you know, from the universal harmonies to tell us exactly how we should be living our lives. You should be clearer when you talk of happiness, Maxime. Some people still confuse it with pleasure. Happiness, virtue. To Robespierre, these were more than just vague aspirations. They were to be the permanent condition of the French citizens in the new republic. The idea that happiness was a new idea in Europe is something that many of the revolutionaries exp expressed. It was uh, a philosophical idea that they took from the Enlightenment and they attempted to put into practice. And they thought that they could legislate so that people would be happy in this world. And that the poor were really the people who should be the powers of the earth. But the poor in 1793 were not the happy, wise peasants of Rousseau's fond imagination. They were the sans culotte of Paris, the miserable urban poor. And to them, happiness meant not virtue, but food. On September the 5th, the Committee of Public Safety discovered the power of the sans culotte for themselves. It has begun. Quick, to Notre Dame. Seek forgiveness. The world is coming to an end. <laughs> it was a day of a full solar eclipse when to the delight of enlightened men who could predict such cosmic events, the noonday skies over Paris darkened. It's one of those things that in earlier times would have sent everyone scurrying away superstitiously. But as far as we can tell, it occasions very little more than, than sort of amusement. During the eclipse, armed sans culotte invaded the National Assembly and demanded action against their enemies, the farmers, who they accused of deliberately starving Paris. Their cry was to make terror the order of the day. And to appease them, their spokesman Collot de Bois was elected to the committee. <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> Very good, Collot. What's your next trick? <laughs> Collot de Bois is an actor and a playwright a theatrical impresario, I suppose you would say. He's someone who comes from the world of the theatre. As far as that radical leadership is concerned, they know best. They are the real representatives of the sans culotte, who are the real patriots. He's brought into the Committee of Public Safety in September 1793, largely as a result of the sans culotte calls for the Jacobins to step up the terror. So he's brought in as a man who will do this, who is prepared to do this. I'm astonished by your predicament. You like flour? Take it from the peasants. Everyone now understands the penalties for hoarding. We have the power of deterrence. Let me tell you about a peasant. You cannot threaten him with words. He lacks the imagination. Even the peasant has heard of the guillotine. He won't believe in anything he cannot see. Oh, really? Oh, it's not heaven he believes in. It's his priest. And he sees his priest every day. And there you have your solution. Remove the priest. And appeal to his patriotism. In Cahor, the civil commissioners did the right thing. The poor of the district were invited to a civic dinner where they were waited on by the rich. When the time comes to cut the corn in Cahor, all parties will cooperate. <laughs> you have no comprehension. Revolution is not a course in ethics, Couthon. To get his wheat, he must slap a farmer across the mouth and point a musket at his wife. Food must be hunted out of the barns with bayonets. That, my friend, is the most efficient method of agriculture we have. The people I represent demand you take firmer measures than you have so far given them. 
This morning, on my way to the convention, I heard the slum children of San Antoine singing a royalist song. Why? Who taught them? My people want the royalists caught and branded on the forehead. They want the aristocrats chained in groups of six and sent to the front lines to fight for the republic. That perhaps is not productive. But you should know the spirit is there. As it is against the aristocrats in this town who hoard leather, grain, timber, soap. I cannot follow this. When he says aristocrats, does he mean merchants? Say merchants, we will understand you. <sighs> merchants, aristocrats, counter-revolutionaries, what does it matter? To most Parisians, they are the same. We will ask the Convention to pass a new law of suspects. Local committees of patriots will have powers of arrest. Those suspected of counter-revolution will have their papers removed and will answer to those committees. Suspicion is a superb thing. It is to liberty what jealousy is to love. More prisoners to be processed through the interminable tribunals. Terror is the order of the day. Huh? Or is it talk? Place the suspects in houses that have been mined. Touch the paper. Boom! The problem is closed. It's incredibly yeah. difficult to understand the psychology of many of these people in the terror. Someone like Collo, there's nothing in his character before 1789 which would lead one to believe that he would do the sort of things that he did in 1793, uh, 94. It brings out a sort of dramatic and violent part of them, which I think probably would have lain latent until they died. Collo's arrival on the committee resulted in the law of suspects, which created whole new categories of anti-revolutionary crime. a raised eyebrow during a patriotic speech, an outmoded form of address. To the secret policemen, such things could now indicate a dangerous sympathy for the aristocracy. Well, this is what terror is about. It's frightening people into conformity. Someone could be heard making a profane joke about committing public safety in a tavern or something, and he could be, you know, lose his head a week later for being an enemy to the patrie pricking your eye with a pin so that you couldn't be one of those sent off to fight for France, um, producing sour wine with the intention of injuring the true patriots, um, declaring in public a fig for the nation. The vast majority of people just sort of got in the way of some sort of beady-eyed informers. And most of these people, I cannot emphasize enough, are ordinary people, are washerwomen and cooks and ex-servants. In the last week of September 1793, Robespierre began to make the link between virtue and state terror more explicit. I know that we cannot flatter ourselves that we have attained perfection, but maintaining a republic surrounded by enemies, fortifying reason in the name of liberty demands, demands moral and physical strengths. Physical strengths. He did so in a carefully worded speech to the convention. Physical strengths that nature has perhaps denied to those who denounce us. The committee has a right to the hatred of kings and rogues. If you do not believe in its seal, then break that instrument. But first, consider the circumstances you are in. Those who denounce us are themselves denounced to the committee. Those who accuse us are themselves being accused. The speech would contain a barely veiled threat to the men it was addressed to. Those who accuse us are themselves accused. Let no one think my intention here is to answer one accusation with another. 
I am committed to never dividing patriots. But I do not count as patriots those who wear the mask of patriotism. And I will expose the conduct of two or three traitors who are the architects of discord and dissension here. What Robespierre's speech made clear was that he had no concept of a loyal opposition. But was this because France was being invaded? Or did it have deeper roots in Rousseau's philosophical idea of the general will? Rousseau has this idea in his writings that if people reflect honestly on the best thing for society, they will all come to the same conclusion, which of course is, is, is a, a fantasy. But this is an idea that then becomes embodied in Jacobin political practice. The good thing about general will is that I simply think that there are political situations of tension, popular enthusiasm, explosion and so on, where we are justified to say something is going on here, you know, where all interests represented, where something like general will constitutes itself. You cannot reproach them for that. And what I don't like in the critics of Jacobinism is that on behalf of rejecting their so-called proto-totalitarian excesses, what lurks behind is for me this uh, cynical liberal wisdom. You see, the lesson of Jacobins is, we should, yes, talk about equality and so on, but secretly we should be aware it doesn't really work. If there were politicians who were not in any way cynical or with this ironic wisdom and so on, it's the Jacobins. Maybe we, we need this today. But what that also means is that people who dissent from those decisions put themselves outside the body politic, put themselves subject to prescription in various ways. The idea that these people cannot be allowed to disagree with what is taken to be the right course of action, the general will embodied in the Convention, the Committee of Public Safety, and ultimately in Robespierre himself. So, thank you very much all for attending this morning. As you know... In October 1793, the committee decided to assault the concept of time itself. A new calendar was created to mark the fact that French men and women had been reborn through the revolution. As you can imagine, we have spent a great deal of The new age, uncontaminated by the old, needed new days and weeks and new months. Our revered poet, Fabre d'Eglantine, has named them. Fabre d'Eglantine was to be guillotined year two, Germinal. His sublime idea is that the Republican calendar shall return the French nation to nature, or more precisely, to agriculture. The images are to reflect the life of the French countryside. So we shall have a peasant hiding his wheat and a hungry sans-culotte chasing him with a pike. Something a little more edifying, I think, Citizen Carnot. They design a new calendar. They, they move away from the old months, from the old idea of the week centred around Sunday. They move the beginning of the year to the autumnal equinox, which is when the Republic was declared in 1792. They reinvent new months, which are structured around natural phenomena of the seasons, of the weather conditions, of the harvest, things like that. Fructidor, the month of fruit. Ventose, the month of wind. Germinal, the month of seeds. Is that Germinal? Uh, no, no. That is Niveau's, the month of snows. Should she not be better dressed if she's going to be out in the snow? In Marseille, a month of snows. <laughs> Robespierre tells me he has never seen the sea. He knows it to be blue. In Marseille, they may never have seen snow. Yes, yes. When do we start? We've already started. The Republican calendar has been backdated to September the 22nd, 1792. So we have already lived through year one. We are mastering this more quickly than I thought. Yes, citizen, this is year two, or to be precise... Vendamire, 14th day, year two of the French Republic. 
Four days later, on October the 9th, 18th Vendomier, the new calendar had its first significant date. On that day, Lyon, a republican city but not a Jacobin one, surrendered to the government army a 